Okay, great. Uh, we're doing another episode of I'm in a Car. So thank you for, for being on the show. I got Ilya from uh, Focus 21. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure, man. So uh, like a true I'm in a Car fashion, we kind of give the audience a little sense of who's on the show. So would you kind of give us maybe a 20, 30 second Cole's notes of where you've come from and kind of what you're up to these days? Yeah, sure. So I came originally from Russia. I was born in Russia. I came to Canada about uh, 11 years ago. Yeah. Uh, went to Conestoga College to study for software engineering technology. Um, then got my first co-op at a company called Intelligent Health Solutions. That's how I've met my co-founder, Jeff Armini. We worked together. I worked for him for about six years as a dev. Yep. And then about four years ago, we founded Focus 21. Awesome. And so what does Focus 21 focus on? <laughs> so we focus on the companies that are ready to jump into the 21st century. Right. That's what 21 stands for. So really what oh, cool. we call ourselves an applied innovation company. We're looking for the companies that want to improve human condition in any way. I was always a passion, had a passion for software that improves human condition in any way. Okay, so break that down quickly for us. So uh, we're looking for these companies who have big goal and uh, want to start in a technology field and not necessarily maybe know how or how to build a scalable either SaaS platform or data-driven platform. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we have a framework to help them to get from zero to two, what do you say, to the, all the way to, you know, having multi-million users and have, being cloud native and being very competitive to Google and other big giants out there. Awesome. That sounds like a ton of fun. Yeah, it is. That's crazy. So um, when you talk about the human condition, can you be just a, like a bit more like what, can you give us an example? Sure. So... I guess a little story, I started playing with computers since I was seven. Yeah, okay. And um, um, it was in Moscow, so my uncle was one of the like, first developers in the 90s, and uh, he used to work on big mind frames when there was no even uh, human-readable compilers and all that stuff. Right, right. So, um, so he had a few computers at home. And he started uploading like simple IT tasks to me because right. <laughs> like, he, yeah, <laughs> he didn't want to do that. So, and obviously I got to play games after I got him done. So I was sure. motivated by playing games, but I really got into I, different IT tasks back then. Then when I was 12, I got my first personal computer and lots of other friends started getting them. But right. in the 90s in Russia, you didn't really have an official software store stores or anything like right, that. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> Everything was pirated. So okay. you go to this, we call book markets, and you <laughs> buy these CDs from, I think it was a FIDO network back then. I don't know how they got all the software. So you, you essentially had pretty, you had to have pretty decent knowledge of some basic IT commands to even compile a game together right, and right. stuff like that. So I became very popular <laughs> among my friends. You get they're hooked up with games. Yeah, all over the to, place. to come over, either fix their computer or you know get the game going. So that's kind of how I started my interactions with computers. And then when I came to Canada, I had an opportunity to go for software engineering. So after two three years, I think uh, one of our professors, uh, when we we're like it was graduating year, started talking to us. Well, you guys. Now you kind of possess this magic of software development. Yeah, okay. What do you want to apply it to? And right. he kind of laid it out for us. Like, it's it's such a broad spectrum. You can go to simulations. You can go to entertainment applications. You can go to gaming. You can you do name it. software. Like, it's just so broad. You yeah. can do embedded software, right? And at that point, I realized... And he also told us about the reality about gaming industry because I think a lot of young uh, developers uh, under 12 they they get into computers like I did for, right like they want to play games and yeah. hey, I want to make games and then uh, when you actually start writing some you understand oh actually that's pretty pretty challenging um, domain and it's pretty competitive and what's the end goal and I got to realize I love games and I play games but I also realized that like we possess this magical power of you know creating new software that's supposed to improve the world, but 
entertainment industry has such a high dollars value right. versus software that does something useful. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> the so, irony. So that kind of like was an eye opener for me, and I wanted to like, yeah, it's probably not as cool as gaming industry, but I want to try first uh, job at something that actually does something good. Right. So that's uh, where I went to work for Jeff, and he was building outbreak management systems. It's a data driven system that essentially help to detect abnormalities and outbreak. And I thought that's oh that's cool that's actually affecting and might save uh, save lives. Yeah, big time. That is definitely and, and that's where meaningful. I got, got a kind of philosophy and passion behind Focus Twenty One, and uh, that's the philosophy that we both share. And we try to find companies that improve human condition in any way. Epic. So that's kind of the story behind. That. That's a cool story, man. Appreciate you sharing. No problem. So four years ago, two people. Yep. Today, thirty. Yep. That's gotta hurt a little going through that kind of growth absolutely so what happened like how, how well you i going? haven't slept for 12 months <laughs> <laughs> i don't even doubt Actually, that no, like, seriously getting, that sounds getting better yeah well um yeah well we we kept doing a good work keep like just normal stuff you know you over deliver constantly over deliver and um at the start you kind of trying to do everything you can just to uh, sustain your company and then philosophy and mantra comes in and you start narrowing down your focus so we started more focusing on health because that's something my um, my co-founder Jeff Armini has PhD in stats and he's an ex veterinarian like he, he knows a lot about health field and yeah, I yeah. gain knowledge a lot by working together on different health projects over the eight years yeah with him so we started focusing more on health and yeah. um, Oh, trust me, health industry needs a lot of help. Right. So we started getting a lot of work and a lot of interesting projects to work on. Cool. Also, some other sustainability projects came came um, came around. So essentially, it's a data-driven platforms that improving either a certain process or making decision making faster. Awesome. So one of the examples, one clients in Toronto, was a it's a group called WCCD World Counts. World the Council on City Data. Right. So they create an ISO standard, and their vision is if in every city in the world collects the data according to the standard, right. then we can start comparing city Epic. And, and cities benchmark them, and it's going to be proper benchmarking yeah, because they me. all collecting data in the same way. And That's a big vision, man. So yeah, and we we, we helped them to get the to the first step. We created a very interactive digital platform. You can go check it out, dataforcities.org. Epic. And I think they started with twenty cities, and now they're signing signing up about three hundred or five hundred this year. Huge. Yeah. That is so cool. And that was the passion, you know, like when you team up four or five to to help companies like them yeah. be as competitive as you know Microsoft was playing in that field. Uh, Google wasn't so much, but again, that's that's kind of that's fun. That's what we're looking for, and, and impactful, right? That's mm -hmm. really cool. So, um, you know, the the biggest kind of purpose of this platform, I'm in a car, is to learn from entrepreneurs and grow your business. Okay. So, you know, going from two people to thirty uh, in four years, you know, that's got to hurt. It's going to break, and there's yeah. going to be a whole bunch of kind of growth and growing pains along that road. So what's kind of something that you've done that, you know, you've learned or has helped with that type of growth, mm -hmm. whether it's with clients and onboarding or whether it's with staff or sure. anything? Sure. Um, number one, what really helped it was us. We joined with, um, we also have, so we have traditional Focus 21 services line when we do professional services for other companies. We also have Focus 21 products that we build our own products. So when uh, about, I think, yeah, about four years ago, we joined Communitech with one of our products called yep. Health and Safety Watch. And I think that was very important for us because we joined from the perspective of like, hey, here's what we know, here's what we don't know. How can we learn what we don't know very fast? Sure. And I'm a big fan of hands-on learning. Uh, I went to college. I couldn't afford U of W. Uh, and college is really hands-on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think what really, really helped, well, first was being at a community tech, surrounded by the people who have similar problems, and then meeting with the uh, mentors and advisory panel there. So through community tech, we made a connection with Alan Corey, who's a great, great 
local entrepreneur and he helps a yeah, lot of startups and he really really cares about community so when that happened i just came to him i i went to him it's like alan we need help big time <laughs> <laughs> we're growing uh, things are going well but we don't want to screw it all up so right. he definitely he helped us like so you know just even having somebody who you can trust and we knew him for some number of years right uh, so when that happened having somebody we can trust guiding us through the process was amazing just somebody who had um, who had um, answers for us for because uh, he's has been through this yeah, and yeah I guess and also like joining tech I joined tech and Vistage and um, that's uh, for those who doesn't know it's it's a group of uh, again small business entrepreneurs grouped by revenue that they make a year sharing similar problems. So that was very, that was a very good move. So surround yourself with people who, who who's done it, yeah. who you can trust, and ask them. And you know, don't be don't be cocky that you know it all, and just be honest with yourself and ask questions that. <laughs> it's cool <laughs> though, you know. I think you an action on them, right? And what's interesting is they can tell you like one a white playbook. It's not like, hey, here's the book, just do this. Right. Obviously, your company is going to be a little bit different, uh, but general advice is just or just having somebody who's there is going to help. Uh, so he kind of told us like keep an eye on the culture, and I think that's was very important to uh, create an onboarding process and really not to tell people what we do but more of a why we do it cool so you would attract people who not necessarily because you still like even if you growth mode you you can't afford super competitive salaries like google and that's why you have to like as you grow in startup and you moving to this growth stage you have to look for people who share the value of your mission yeah that's cool otherwise so i mean there's just to unpack a couple of things you just said there because i think there's some really really valuable lessons and one is ask for help yep i think a lot of people um either maybe are um a little bit too confident in their what they think they know uh but some people also just maybe don't want to burden other people but i think that you know to your point there are organizations like Communitech or any of research innovation center that can actually help you through providing a support mechanism where you're actually encouraged to ask for help. And uh, I know in my experience, it's probably been a couple of instances where I've asked for help maybe a little bit too late. And I mean, I've learned my lessons, but I think that's a huge one. And the second one that you mentioned there was um, mentorship. Mm -hmm. You know, really finding other people that have been through what you want to go through. And I think that is remarkably valuable. Oh, absolutely. So if you're real about your thing, you have to find a mentor. That's cool. Everybody, like, I don't know, every, everybody I think famous, uh, they all had a variety of mentors through their life. You have to. Big time. You can't know it all. You just can't. And the last thing you mentioned there that I thought was really cool and something that we believe in in a big, big way is, is focusing on why you do what you do and the value of what it is you're trying to, you know, put a dent in the universe with mm -hmm. uh, in order to recruit people that, you know, believe in what you believe in and aren't necessarily doing everything for the almighty dollar. Yep. And so what what kind of things have you done on that last note uh, to bring that thing to life? You know, it's one thing to have a, a, a poster on a wall with a statement on it that could be of meaningful value or not, depending on what company you go through. But outside of that, what kind of things have, have has Focus 21 and you done to bring why you do what you do to life? Um, well, first of all, I'm I'm very honest um, on the inter on the interviews. So um, I actually to like when we went from six to fifteen, I had to conduct hundred interviews in two weeks myself <laughs> in person. Marathon. No wonder you're not sleeping. So what I've learned really quick is. <laughs> It's just simply I didn't have time. I got to the needs of it, and I was just like really honest. I'm like, look, you're gonna work your your, your butt off here, and no, like all the reality. But yeah. like, here's why we do it, and like, you're either in or, or not. Like, right. I, I was just being transparent without trying to pretend who we're not and just saying who we are. Uh, that's that was one thing. So still, and I'm a big fan of Elon Musk, and I think I've read it in his book, and that really stuck with me. So it doesn't matter whether we're we gonna be 300, 500. Um, I'm still gonna be doing like if we're hiring a person, I wanna have at least 20 minute interview with them. Yeah. Cool. So that's what he did too. So that's I think that's 
That's very important for you not to create a hierarchy of a pyramid when, like, as organization grows, you don't even know, <laughs> right? Like the people being hired, and like that's that's not cool. Yeah, like, and especially if you don't know the person that's hiring the new person, yes. then you're really disconnected. Then you have a you have a big big problem because yeah. how like do you, it's just from the even communication perspective, how can you rely on different layers not to alter the vision and that broken you, telephone that, that you had? Yeah. So yeah. so that's one being honest, transparent on the interviews, and talk a lot about values. Second is. I prefer to still be very on the floor with engineers and uh, designers and everybody. So right. not to like even we moved into new offices on purpose. I I want a desk on the floor and I want to I will, I would always want a desk on the floor. Just stay in. Tune. Just so people can just stop by and talk. Like you'll be surprised once you're in office, you know, and the organization grows. They're like, oh, they will portray. Oh, Rob is a big boss. I shouldn't bug him. <laughs> But if you're just sitting right there, there and and there might be some important decisions being made right? all the time, man. It's so funny you so, say that too. We have a very open uh, concept, two floors, and uh, the only um, rooms we have in our office are actually the lunch team room and meeting rooms. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everybody is fully uh, open and accessible at all times, and it has a bit of a distraction uh, factor to it. But it definitely keeps everything really approachable and accessible. So it's neat. You, it's neat you mentioned that. And then I think um, you kind of you kind of deliver the vision, you plan the seed, but really um, empower a team to enhance on that vision and add to it. Because if it's just a dictatorship, we're going over there, it's not going to work. So talk about that quickly then. I mean, um, a lot of people probably understand at some rational level that the leader's job is to cast a vision and, and institute the idea of what this company is trying to do and where it's going. Uh, but then making it so that you can empower your people to improve that vision and, and you know, tweak it. Uh, what kind of things are you doing as a team to, to make that happen? Um, making sure that they can truly make a mistake. So talk about that So quickly. people people talk about, oh, let your people do mistakes and lots of leaders. And what I realized, and I was guilty of that too, uh, it's not easy to offset the tasks. As a leader, your rela your responsibilities change. Like as you grow, right? When you were four people, you were doing uh, you were everything. Like, you were doing everything. You were sales. You were project management. Sometimes you were even developer and you were doing everything. Accounting, <laughs> right? So as you grow, and like some like you can't do all of the things very well. Some of them you did excel at. Otherwise, the business wouldn't be around. Right. So. But the thing is, like you're excelled at it, like you you probably can now um, um, focus on something else the company needs. So your attention needs somewhere else to really enhance that. So passing over somebody something that you did good to somebody to do it better, it's very hard. Yeah. People talk about it, but like me telling like, oh Eric, okay, tomorrow I really want you to leave Focus Twenty One. Yeah. yeah. Like most likely you're gonna make some expensive <laughs> from the my point makes mistakes yeah and people are afraid of it sure and uh, we had few situations that I remember like there was some mistakes and client were like okay well we, we don't we're on the verge quitting you guys right and we just onboarded them and like just be, getting back to the client and like figure out what the situation and say hey um, I still we're still backing up this person because we believe they they have a great potential. You have to just trust us because we're your technology partners. It's just a small <laughs> things, and let's look over it. Let's see what happens next. Yeah, and that's really makes an effect on the team. And they're like, "Hey, I made a huge mistake. It might have cost company tons of money. <laughs> probably, but probably they backed did. me up. Yeah, obviously, if I do three or fours, I'm gonna get. <laughs> There's gonna be some fired. kind of consequence yeah, eventually, but, but still. But I like that's my way of showing the trust and really putting responsibility back on that person. That's cool, and it's uh, you know I think what you said is accurate in that there's a lot of people that talk about the idea of creating mm -hmm. a culture where failure is okay, but actually letting that happen and it being real is a totally different thing altogether. It's like you know letting your kid to fall on the bike. Sure, and you has know to he, you know he or she is gonna fall and there's gonna be some injury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's bound to happen, yeah. and they'll never learn. It's like it's the same thing with fire, right? Like uh, a human being doesn't know fire's hot until they touch it, and you can tell them till you're blue in the face. But there's a human condition 
that says, uh, oh, ah, okay, yeah, what they were saying is actually accurate. Yep. It takes that mistake to make the learning actually yep. happen. So that's super cool. So, uh, you, I mean, you've been doing this four years. You've grown to thirty people. I mean, that's 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 pretty exponential growth. Um, if there if there's one thing that kind of sticks out to you over the last four years that you've learned that you wish you knew four years ago when you started this whole thing, or you'd want to share with entrepreneurs that are starting their own business or about to hit growth mode, what would that be? Um, get ready, get ready for a tremendous amount of pain, <laughs> and and my challenge was trying to get like I was still being a little bit get rich quick mentality and it's really really crippling so you have to be super patient like you have to it's like hey i'm gonna be tons of pain and most likely i'm gonna lose that's kind of mentality but um i might win right so just yeah just being prepared for it and first successes uh don't don't get too high on them because the next problem is just around the corner right just, uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people talk about this idea. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Oh, yeah. Like, of- it, it, it's like, you know, and I think Gary Vee talks about it a lot. Uh, people, f- like, some entrepreneurs think, I'm, I'm 22. I'm going to launch a startup in two years. If it's not $10 million, I'm going to quit. <laughs> I'm going to do this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try another startup. Yeah. And But really, they should be like, no, I'm... The, the, the real thing it should be I'm going to spend next 10 years yeah. try to build one company yeah. that's more realistic approach cool and well, if, the thing and is, if by, by 30 or 35 I can decide something but like really giving yourself enough buffer for what's realistic and 10 years on starting a business even if it fails you're going to get the best MBA that you could possibly get exactly your life. exactly yeah, exactly really, really like op- being open minded for experience well and the thing is too like what I was saying about um you know, people say business and, and, and life and success is a marathon, not a sprint. Marathons hurt. They suck. And you don't see anybody end a marathon like, let's burn! <laughs> like, they're hurting. Like, and it's, there's it's, tons of preparation comes and, into and it, tons right? of pain. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I really appreciate that perspective. That's awesome. Well, thank you for doing this, Ilya. No it was an Thanks, absolute Rob. pleasure. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, see you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye.